to number 46. Hymn number 46. And stand with me when you find your spot as we sing all four verses of All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. <clears throat> Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song. Yes. We just thank you for this day that we're here. The ones that are not here, Father, we just ask to be with them and bring them back to us. The ones that are on uh, online, Father, that uh, they'll get a blessing out of the service today. And all, Father, be with us as we sing these songs and hear the message today, Father. Be able to lift our hearts and be able to tell people about you, Father. We pray in your name. Amen. 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 All right, y'all can be seated. Go ahead and get a little preliminaries and things out of the way this morning. I've got a lot of people on the prayer this morning. Well, we went over that in Sunday school this morning. Be faithful to pray for those. I will mention, though, uh, Colton and Mulch will be going to the oncologist tomorrow again after the results last week that there's still cancer there uh, to set up his attack plan or approach plan. We might call it, be praying for him, that everything go well. And, and as Brother Bryant said it well in Sunday school this morning, that, that ever how the Lord takes care of it, that it's a way that everybody stands back and says, wow, what a God. And I just tell you, behind the scenes, um, it's absolutely amazing the things that God's done that, that's not known public. And there, there's a, it's just, he's, he's already worked in such an amazing way. But uh, remember that, I uh, got a good report on Brother Wayne Giles last week. Praise the Lord for that. And then uh, Brother Charles will be going Wednesday to an appointment, um, have some little things done to his face there. So uh, be praying for him and all that everything goes well and, and uh, get, get, get things taken care of real quick there and not have to linger there and all. But let's remember to pray for all these on our prayer list. Y'all got a lot of different ones. Um, let me say, I've got a couple of announcements that's not in the bulletin. Before I do that, uh, Brother just y'all put that picture up. We, we, we got all but one spindle yesterday, and it's not in the picture. Yeah, we did. yeah it is. It is, too. See the snaggle tooth? I need a little laser pointer, but in the, see if I can do this. Yeah, y'all hold me up there. See, up in this picture here, the little snaggle tooth, the one spindle missing. Why did you get that in the picture? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I should have started that spindle and put it on that side, shouldn't I? <laughs> it hit me back. <laughs> but uh, anyway, 
praise the Lord for that. Thank you that gave and, and some was able to help. I apologize, that's a project that I would rather have got more people involved in the legwork of it, particularly some of you young bucks sitting up there. But it was hard, and we did have a time that some came one time, but most time it was, it was my schedule and his schedule when we worked out together that we could, you know, hey, uh, can we get, can, let's go over in the morning and go work two or three hours, or we'd stop by in the afternoons each uh, sometimes and all. So we, I apologize we didn't get more people involved with it, but a lot of you gave toward it and all, and it's a blessing. And they've just been so thankful and appreciative. And Ernie's a pretty good cook, by the way. But, but uh, anyway, appreciate all y'all giving towards that. And we just praise the Lord for being able to take care of that project to help them out and all. But uh, as far as the other, a couple other things, the uh, not in your bulletin, the 29th will be a fifth Sunday. Uh, we'll do the Lord's Supper during the PM, during the AM service. And then the fifth, the night service will be the fifth Sunday singing service. We'll have a... Uh, more of a singing service that night. And then uh, the 18th of February, the 14th is, sweet, is Valentine's Day. The 18th will be, we're going to have a sweetheart banquet in our fellowship hall over here. Um, and more of that, as, as far as we put, when we put that together and have more details of that, we'll let you know more details coming up of that. But probably around 5 o'clock on the 18th, go ahead and write that on the calendar. I'm pretty sure it'll be 5 o'clock on the 18th. Um, I, we don't have the menu yet, but we almost got the menu worked out, hadn't we? But I'm looking forward to that, and we'll play some games and things. Yes, ma'am? We have to have the sweethearts Do what? We have to have the sweethearts. No, you know, <laughs> no, I'm glad you asked that, sister. I'm glad you did. In the past, I used to be, I used to be pretty strict about it being couples only, and that was so unfair because everybody, everybody's not a couple, but everybody can have fun at it. Now, the games will probably marry couples because we don't want to embarrass a stew out on them. But, but, uh, but no, as far as that, uh, you know, all the adults, not, not, let's let, let, let step like this, it will be for adults, yes. <laughs> but, uh, but, and, and may, we may, if we can, we may maybe have nursery and somebody could keep to them. We'll try to work that out if that's necessary and all that. But as far as in the banquet part of the adults, but, but everybody, all the adults are welcome to that. Uh, I, I learned it was a mistake to limit it to certain ones. No, that's not very fair, is it? Okay, uh, I guess that's all as far as announcements. Brother Bryant, come on up and sing a couple more good songs, brother. All right. 629, if you've placed your faith in Christ, then you've got a mansion over the hilltop, and we want to sing about it this morning. 629, we'll sing all three verses. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one that silver. In that bright land where we'll never grow old And someday yonder we will never more wander But walk the streets that are pure as gold Though often tempted, tormented and tempted and like the prophet, my pillow a stone. And though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know you give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old and someday yonder we will never more wander but walk the streets that are 
purest gold. Let's stand as we sing on that last verse. Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged. I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a harp and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander but walk the streets that are pure as gold. Amen. And remain standing if you can. To turn to 119 as we sing about his great is thy faithfulness. 119. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, born unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings O mine with ten thousand beside great is thy faithfulness Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. Amen. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. Thank you. You may be seated.
Just an old rejected relic On the auction block They decided to throw me away The auctioneer asked Who will take her? The room grew quiet and still Till a stranger stepped forward He said, I will If you had known me Before I knew him You'd understand why I love him If you had known me Before I knew him You'd understand my love I hadn't much to offer just heartaches and fear And a life that was filled with despair For my rags he gave me riches For my fear he traded peace For my old life he gave me Blessed relief If you had known me Before I knew him You'd understand why I love him If you had known me before I knew him, you'd understand my love. If you had known me before I knew him, you'd understand my dismissed to junior church thank you miss Kathy I'm gonna put this up there out there because my ADD catch me so I don't squeal I've been sitting there trying to remember what I'm trying to say, and all, all I'll see is that speaker. <laughs> I'll take your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Acts, to chapter 3. I don't know how the picture was published, but there was a, I think the elementary school or somebody was on one of the websites or something. Anyway, uh, Joseph Sutton is our, grew up in my community, this uh, Georgia State Trooper now, did a little thing with the school and a little thing with the children, a little story time or something, went and read a book to him. I'm not sure exactly what he did, but the picture that got out of it in the social media is the class and all these children around and Joseph standing back and Christopher. It's a real good little picture of Christopher right down in front of him. You can see him just, you know, kind of like the picture of Joseph and Christopher. It's a real good picture. But uh, anyway, Acts chapter 3. God's good to us, isn't he? Uh, what's over? Loving God, a living God, 
He's just uh, he's better to us than we deserve. Um, I've not forgot that I've mentioned to you some things for the year, some things, but I've been I've been studying and reading on the subject, and I want to do it better. But on, on the subject of worship, I've just uh, man just really been seeking the Lord's face concerning that for the church for vision for the church. Now now when I say worship, I'm not just talking about singing or or raising your hand, not not those things, but but the heart and the things that the our thought life and everything that involves true worship that spills over into the other aspects of our life. But worship's a lot bigger, a much bigger Bible truth than the songs we sing before I preach. That is worship, should be worship, but worship is a life. Worship is a um, the, an attitude of the heart, and I'm, I'm excited about it as I get put more together and, and uh, I'm able to share it with you and preach on the subject more and all, but just be praying for me uh, concerning that. In Acts chapter 3, stand with me if you would. Acts chapter 3, I'm going to read the first 10 verses, then 11, so I guess I'm going to read all 11 verses. The Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried when they laid daily, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked them, asking alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was, uh, was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at, at that which had happened unto him. Verse 11, and as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them into the porch which, that is called beautiful, or in the porch that's called beautiful, I mean called Solomon's, excuse me, uh, greatly wondering. Uh, have you ever noticed in life there's progressions? Uh, in the Bible it starts off in progression. It starts off and, and there's dust and dirt. Uh, and back in Genesis, dust, dirt, and it's stones and mountains. You can see progressions in the, in the making of earth. And, and uh, through the Bible there's time, there's time progressions mentioned in the Bible. There's Twinkling of the eye, what's well, a split? I mean, that's lickety split there. That's pretty quick. Uh, there's the moment, which is quick. The hour, the day, a day. I mean, a, a, a watch. We have watches in the Bible. They're split up in watches. There's days, weeks, months, seasons, year, millennial, and eternity. So, about everything we do, a lot of things we do in life is, is in progressions. Today, let's see the segments of progression that ought to make up a Christian's life as we look at this text this morning, the things that we see uh, that are, I believe are pictures, and uh, we'll just make comparisons, some things in this man's life uh, that ought to be in our lives, and we'll be challenged from the Word this morning. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us this morning. God, I pray that you just give me wisdom and knowledge, Lord, and courage to preach this message, Lord. God, I pray that you'd help me to preach it in your power. Lord, that I'd be a mouthpiece for you. God, I pray that you'd help us that distractions be set outside and left outside. Lord, I pray that we'd focus on the word this morning and hearing from heaven. 
God help us to gain from this story here in Acts chapter 3. God help me to preach the Bible in truth in your power. God help us today. If there's one here today that's never been saved, God, I pray that you'd use the preaching and the Holy Spirit of God, Lord, that you'd work in their heart or that today might be their day of salvation. God help us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Y'all bear with me just a minute. I adjusted my brightness a little while ago and got a little bit too dim. Nobody wants to see the old iPad glow on the preacher's face where it looks like the thing is glaring up here and they don't want that way. I try to keep it turned down low, but I had to turn down so low I about couldn't, couldn't see it. But uh, anyway, it's good. Uh, God sure is good. I love this passage this morning. I love this, this story in here, and we can see a, a lot of things here. This book of Acts uh, is an exciting book. Uh, it's been said that the book of Acts is a guide to missions. Uh, chapters 1 through 7 show us the finest of home missions, uh, and Jerusalem being the center stage and starting off there, everything being sent out of Jerusalem to start with, chapter 8 and up, teach the original world's, world missions as they go out. In chapter 8, Philip goes to Samaria. In chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus gets saved, and, and uh, man, he pretty quickly surrenders to missions, and he don't waste a lot of time about it. Uh, man, he starts going preaching, planting churches, and, that, and then the whole book of the rest of the book of Acts is uh, all about planting churches and go plant a church and folks getting saved and plant a church and folks get a, you know, and they get saved and they become, they become a local body and it continues on. And, and that's God's plan now, by the way. That hadn't changed. That missionaries go, they reach centers, they plant and organize a church that assembles together. That church sends missionaries that go and that model still continues on even to this day. And God doesn't tell us anywhere to change that plan until the Lord catches out here, the church is not on earth anymore for seven and a half years, or seven years rather. Uh, so that's still God's plan. I'm thankful for our missionaries and those that are home missions and those that are worldwide missions that are preaching the gospel or planting churches. Now I know some missionaries are helps type missionaries. Some are uh, do work with deaf and, and have specific uh, callings that aren't necessarily church planting, but either way about it, they're involved in assisting and coming alongside and helping local churches, even if they're not planting local churches. But mission, true Bible missions has got to involve local church some kind of way. Sent out of local church, responsible, and um, his authority is his local church, and then their work should be to plant and assist local churches. But we see that in the book of Acts. Um, in our text, we also see a basic progression of man. And we see this fellow here. Uh, I'm speaking of spiritual things now, not, uh, not in the sense that he was crippled and couldn't walk and had to carry him and lay him there, but the sense that, uh, that in the type that we can see there of a, a man that couldn't walk and then a man that could walk and a man that uh, went further than that. But God's got a plan for each Christian. And it'll always involve at least one of these three different actions uh, now, the, uh, for his children, it'll always involve step one, but it ought to go to step two and step three. Um, let's just move on along here, but only when we're uh, following along the things I'll talk about this morning will the Great Commission be fulfilled. We've got to be uh, in taking these steps of growth as Christians, or there's no Great Commission being taken up. Nobody... Uh, active and faithful, sharing the gospel, preaching, preaching the word, uh, doing those things that involve folks getting saved and discipled and growing, that they would do the same thing. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 41, are one day. We've talked about that before. I preached a few messages on Acts chapter 2, 41 to 47, but Acts chapter 1, verse 41, 1 through 41, are one day. What day? What day was it? Pentecost. Pentecost, 50. 50 after the death, burial, and resurrection. He met with them. He empowered the church, and the Spirit uh, fell, came out and, was, and we became the 
spirit-filled believers that we are now. I mean, not spirit-filled necessarily, but spirit-indwelt believers from that day on and the power of the Spirit uh, being available to the local church ministries to uh, serve Him. Acts 2, verses 42 to 47 involve many days. Uh, we don't know exactly how many, but I suppose a few months. But then this one day on Acts chapter 3, we start off, and in verse 1 again, it says, uh, now, it says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Now, the ninth hour, what would that be? The Jewish hour was started at sunrise. And keep in mind, there's different time frames. There's the historical Jewish time, and then there's the time in, in different settings in the New Testament of the times and the watches. And then there, there was the Old Testament that had different watches, I, I should have said. And there's some difference in the New Testament. But in the time of speaking of here, the, the, the day started at 6 o'clock in the morning, which was what they considered daylight. They didn't have daylight savings times, did they? But uh, anyway, it started then, and it says, uh, and it was nine hours later, I mean, it was three o'clock in the afternoon when they were there, six o'clock in the morning plus nine hours puts you at three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, but it says it's in the hour of prayer being the ninth hour, being nine from the beginning of the day, being at three o'clock in the morning, what, nine o'clock in the morning. It doesn't really matter. I wouldn't argue with that point or anything, but uh, just you find a little bit more depth when you study a little bit more Bible. Verse 2, it says, And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, uh, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So in verse 2, there's a picture of a lost man. He's laid, laid there. They brought him and laid him. No hope. Just carried there. Not going anywhere. Uh, just passing through life day by day, clicking off calendar days. In his misery, misery, and that's a good picture of a of a lost person. I believe in the case of that, not only was he physically crippled, but I believe he was a lost man as well. But he was there and just passing life, wishing for something better. Uh, it says in verse three, it says, "Ask alms of them that entered into the temple." Uh, you know, there's a lot of folks that go uh, go to church for all the wrong reasons. He didn't go; he, he was going. Uh, there, but anyway, I, I, a lot of folks go to church for the wrong reasons, and I've had people show up before service, just and they, they'll show up and they'll say, I need to talk to the preacher. I need to talk to the preacher and deacons, and they're not interested in coming and getting fed. They want a check. They want some money. Hey, and there's nothing wrong with us if the Lord lead to help people like that, but if a man comes and the first thing he asks for is money, he don't want to sit and won't sit and hear the gospel, won't hear the preaching, I, I'm sorry, we're not, a, we're not a bank, we're not a loan institution, but we'll be glad to help people the Lord lead us to do, but it's sad to me, the, the sad part, of the reason I say that, it's sad to me that a person sees a church as a place for a paycheck rather than a place for worshiping God and learning to know who God is, and you know, it kind of goes back to those saying, I'll, I'll block this up, but you know, if you uh, give a man a fish, you feed him a meal, but if you teach him to fish, he can, feed, he can eat a lifetime. But if a man come to church, a person come to church just for the little benefit, the little physical benefit they can get, well, all that satisfies that is that little physical benefit. Well, it'll be about coming to uh, learn more about Christ and uh, uh, about that. And I know lost people don't understand going to church, getting saved. I, I understand that, and, and you can work in those. But let me get back on subject here. There's a picture of a lost man not going anywhere. Verses 3 and 5. The Bible says, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asking alms? And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. So verse 3 of 5, his man's only hope was in physical things. He was just hoping for to go there and somebody have pity and uh, maybe throw a quarter in his can and maybe uh, give him leftovers out of their Happy Meal or something. Uh, but he was going there every day just going looking for physical things like so many in today's society. People, the only thing they get out of bed for is to make a dollar and they go to bed at nighttime worrying about another dollar and they just want the physical things of life, not concerned with the spiritual things 
things. And I, I just want everybody, we have Christians, so important for us to understand and have this message that this life that we live, even if uh, we've got several people in their 80s here, and, and, I, and I know that's a long time for you and I, that seemed like, wow, that's a lot of years, isn't it, uh, to have lived and all, but that's just a little old bitty. I, I saw this morning or yesterday where a lady somewhere around here just passed her 114th birthday. And the oldest person they know about living in this area and all. And that seems like a long time, but that's just a little old bitty drop in the bucket compared to eternity. And folks are so concerned with filling up their bucket and their, their bucket list and filling up their bank accounts and, and uh, making their, known big, their name known big and doing all these physical things that, that have no eternal value. And it's sad that people can't put all their energy and life into a, a, a lifespan of just 70, 80 years. Now, I know that sounds crazy. What I'm saying, eternity is for a long, long time. I start to say eternity is for eternity. Well, it is, isn't it? Eternity goes on and on and on. And there's either heaven or hell. There's so much more concern. And for the lost, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, make sure you get saved before you leave here today. Make sure you know that you know that you know that if you died, you'd go to heaven. Because it don't matter if you're seven years old or if you're 77 or if you're 107. I don't think we got anybody quite that old quite yet. But, uh, but it don't matter of those days. If you don't know Christ, I want you to know this little bit of time that you'll spend on this earth is just a drop in a bucket compared to the hell that you'll spend in eternity and if you die without Jesus Christ. I asked the question, he was, he was, his hope was in physical things as he went to the temple that day and went there. Uh, and, and, but much like a lot of people today, their hope is only in physical things. And I'd ask you this question this morning, is your economy in things below or in things above? I hope in things above. In verse 2, uh, you know, I, I already mentioned this. He was going to church for all the wrong reasons. Look at verse 4. This is a child's man. Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John said, look on us. Now, that's a big old statement. Church, I'd have to ask you the question. Are our lives such Do we have the message in our heart and on our lips and ready? When we go to a place and a lost person a person, Lord, kind of nudges our heart about that, 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 that we could say that with a pure heart as they did, look on us. My, my, that's pretty challenging to me. I, I'm, I'm a, unfortunately, a lot of Christians got that all wrong. They've got a, a look on us like, oh, look at us. We're somebody. Look at the, look at the way we carry Look at who we are. Boy, got that nose stuck up there and pharisaical in their attitude and the way they carry themselves, all, all their lifestyle and everything and all. It's all a lot of times for show for man. And, and if, they, if they're saying look on us, it's for the wrong reasons. But it ought to be, and I preached about that wins not because I hope that we have inside. And being able to give an answer for that hope, it says, look on us. Can you say that? And verse 5 is interesting to me. It says, he gave heed unto them. They said, look on us. And verse 5 answers and said, and he gave heed unto them. He apparently turned and looked on them. It said, expecting to receive something of them. And I know he was expecting a quarter or a hamburger or whatever. I probably didn't have hamburgers back then, but you know what I mean? A morsel of food or something physical. Now, I just want you to know, I believe there's a great message in there that lost people, lost people are expecting something for us. And it's sad what they oftentimes get from us, from the uh, TV evangelists you can't hear. Now, now, there's good preachers on TV, don't misunderstand me. But a lot of them is full of their liars, full of heresy is what I was going to say. And when the number across the screen is wanting cash is a bigger message than the message he's speaking. And he's got so much gold and diamonds on his fingers, you can't hear the words he's preaching for all his flash and pomp and all that kind of stuff. I, man, I don't know about that stuff. I don't know who's going to get help from all that. But they're expecting something from us. And boy, we have the answer, don't we? His name's Jesus. There's repentance and faith, salvation, eternal salvation. But he looked at them. In verse 6, it says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. 
in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That's a big old uh, verse right there towards missions and towards soul winning and sharing the gospel. Then Peter, Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But listen to this. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Let me say something. We didn't get saved to bite our tongue and never share the gospel. I, I, I've mentioned this. I mentioned, I think, Wednesday night. We've got the bread. We've got the water. Uh, we've got the goods. I'm talking about we've got the glorious light of the gospel inside us. That light, we've been enlightened. How sad for us not to share the bread. The news, I was at a missions revival years ago. Uh, was it Barker, Alan Barker, I think, was preaching, and he uh, passed out. Well, I remember two different things had to do with bread, but he's preaching on bread and passing out the bread. And he had a piece of slice of light bread. Every one of them in a little baggy Ziploc bag. And before the service, he went around and passed out everybody in there a piece of light bread. And he preached on that thought, how sad for us to all have bread and there's people starving and we got the bread. But he wasn't talking about starving in their bellies. He's talking about starving in their hearts. Let's look at this fellow, the, the effect that took place when they went in with willing hearts, willing service, filled with the power of God and when came across this man that was empty and void of God and this a divine appointment put up here in Acts chapter 3 verse 7 and 8 the Bible says and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength and he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple walking and leaping and praising God first of all there has to be a stand and talking about progression this morning he said he stood up there has to be a stand, and there, there needs to be. A, now, first of all, there needs to be a, in a pit. That's a picture of salvation. There, he received physical strength and stood. But, but for a person, if you're here today and lost, you need to get saved. The first step of doing anything for the Lord, of any uh, credible service that has any eternal value. But if you're here today and lost, you need to turn your life over to Jesus Christ. Get saved today. Maybe you're listening by internet and you've never been truly born again. My friend, if you don't know Christ, you need to repent and get saved today. But he stood up and we see a picture in there. Now in the spiritual realm of things in Romans 5, 1, uh, we see that can be a, a type and a picture of getting saved. It says, therefore, being, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And that's talking about our standing in Christ. That's the fact that we're in him and he's in us. We're, we're, that's, our, that's got to do with our position in Christ. Meaning that simply we're saved. We're no longer a lost person. But we're saved and we're standing in grace in Jesus Christ. So if you don't know Christ, please turn to him today and, take a, and be a standing person. That your position is changed. That you're standing and then for a child of God, once we're standing, well, there's some things in the Word of God, of God about standing. Uh, hey, number one, our, our letter A under that one, if you'd like, uh, well, to stand upright. In Psalm 20, verse 8, the Bible says, They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Job 1.1, 1, 1, I love this description. What a challenge for a child of God that we ought to live like Job did and hope we don't come across the trials Job come across, amen. But in verse 1 it says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Boy, I love that description of Job. What an what amazing thing to be recorded in the Word of God about one of his servants, a man that stood upright. That's amazing. That's good stuff there, isn't it? He, stood, he was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. He didn't want anything to do with evil. He ran from it. Ecclesiastes 7.29 says, Lo, this, this only have I found that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. Watch out. Hey, the inventions seem to get a sidetrack and seem to trip us up a lot of times, don't they? 
And it's sad how we've become dependent on everything but God anymore. Hey, I thank God for medical science. I thank God for automobiles. I thank God for air conditioners this morning. I was very thankful for the heater in that automobile, wasn't you? Uh, but I'm going to tell you what, we get so uh, dependent on technology and inventions and all such as that. Well, I'm going to tell you what, uh, there ain't nothing like the sweet blood of Jesus Christ cleansed from sin and the grace of God give us strength to walk on. Hey, to just continue on, just to be in, stand strong and stand firm. We ought to stand upright. We ought to stand on number on letter B, on solid ground, Hebrews 2.1, the Bible says, Therefore we ought to give them more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest any time they should, uh, we should let them slip. I will stand on solid ground. I'm talking about a stand on the Word of God, on the solid foundation, not a foundation built on sand, but on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Standing on the truth of the Word of God that's never changing truth. It's not affecting change. I know you buy a computer and this is old, uh, old thought, but it's true more now than ever has been. You buy one before you get it home and plugged up and turned on and your program set up in it and all that. That thing is obsolete and there's three or four new models that's done come out and you'll never stay ahead of that game because it's ever changing and the rules that were applied yesterday. Uh, you know, I used to think I liked Windows like Windows uh, 4 or 5 or some of those that I've worked on for uh, years, you know, years ago we all did. That's all we had. That was the latest grace at that time. And I'd get used to it and, and I'd get a new computer that had 10 in it or 11 or 8 or something. Man, got all that extra stuff in there and I couldn't stand it, boy. And, but after I use it about a year, you don't realize you get used to it. And then you go open your old computer look something up and it's got Windows, one of them old programs in it, you know, uh, 3 or a 4 or something like that. You think, man, that thing's obsolete. Uh, Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all ever done that before? You think, where's that other button, that little quick button to make up my mistakes and all? Them new ones help you out a little bit if you're smart enough to use them. And therefore, I struggle. But I'm just saying, it's ever-changing world. The words, this is a whole other message. I don't get deep in it, but the words we use, this world is making a mess of our language and the words and things. And, and I'm not just talking about because of the sake of the word. I'm talking about because of the sake of truth. Marriage doesn't mean marriage anymore like God meant. Holy doesn't mean holy like God meant. Saved doesn't mean saved like God means. There's a lot of words that the, that the world has changed and they're shifting saying we need to stand on solid ground. Hey, X says, and that kind of leads us to third uh, letter C under uh, number one there. Hey, we need to stand on holy ground. God's called us to holiness. When he saved us, he expects us to live holy lives. I'm not talking about sinless perfection. You ain't gonna until we see him. But his desire is for us to desire to walk in holiness. He told Moses, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And in the presence of God, I, I, I know there's... I'm, I'm, using that as a springboard for that thought, but he was in the presence of God. It was the, the holy ground. And we as children, born again children of God, that's before the cross. Think about us. We know what was endured for our salvation. We know what the price it was paid to pay for it and the commands of God that we'd walk in, that we'd be holy people. And on this side of Calvary, looking back in the presence of God Almighty, uh, Man, I'm getting so much into that thought of worship when I say these things, but in the thought of being in the presence of God Almighty, uh, it ought to be an attitude and a spirit in our hearts of holy ground, walking on that we're always in holy ground because we're always in His presence. And we all desire to live a life of holiness. He stood... And then getting saved is a change, in, is a standing, a change in your position. And then after we stay, we ought to stand on some things. In verse 8, it says, leaping up, stood, and he walked. He didn't just stand still, he walked. We ought to walk on. By the way, the title stand up, walk on, and run home. We ought to walk on. Well, there's a song. You all have heard that old song, Walk On? I've heard some youth groups sing it before. Man, it's a good song, but I can't remember how it goes enough to try to sing it right now. Have anybody else, you all ever heard it? You know what I'm talking about? A good song, a good, powerful song. As he stood up, he, man, it didn't take him long. He stood up, he started walking. 
And we as children of God, a lot of times folks stand and change their positions, change, but they never really start walking. They just kind of stand still all the Christian life. We ought to walk carefully. Ephesians 5, 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what, what the will of the Lord is. Walk on, walk circumspectly. I like that. I don't know if I've ever told y'all this or not before, but every time I see that word walk circumspectly, my, my mama always kept a, y'all know what a car table is? I don't know if they sell them anymore or not, but a uh, little four-legged table that the legs fold up. Well, I guess the originals probably didn't fold up. That probably come around my, my generation. Probably used to be just solid tables back a long time ago. But card table, but for mama, in my house, it was a puzzle table. And my mama was always working jigsaw puzzles, and it got to be a... Mm, uh, got to be a big thing with the grandchildren... I'm going to have old puzzle working, and you know, the box over here, I, I never thought about it. I wish I'd thought about it sometimes, just get a couple of pieces of that puzzle, I'd put them in a Ziploc bag and hide them somewhere. You know, and then, and then after she got put together and say, Mom, are you looking for these? <laughs> I traded you these for that whooping I was going to get. <laughs> but she'd have a half-finished puzzle, and it got to be a big deal with the grandchildren. I mean, whoever came to her house would just sit down and work the puzzle a little while. But I said that, say, I went down memory lane, sorry about that. I said that, say that, but we always also had old kitty cats. When I was a little boy, we'd have, man, I seen a pile of kittens be born, and, and man, and, and I, better, I, I better keep on because I'm thinking, I'm thinking about little tricks we used to play on them kittens and all that kind of stuff. You'd be fa- surprised how fast a kitten can slide on a hardwood floor, though. You'd be surprised. But uh, I was always amazed, though, a cat could run, he'd jump up on that table and walk across that table and not move a puzzle piece. I mean, just something about the way a cat walked. And I've always thought about that, that they, they walked circumspectly. They didn't uh, just kick their feet all around and move. A puppy, now, if a puppy got on the table, that puzzle's gone. Put it back in the box, start over. But a cat's different. But a Christian and our walk, we ought to walk circumspectly, being real careful where we put our feet down, where we put our heart down, where we put our thought life down at. We ought to be careful as we walk this walk. We ought to walk on. Not only walk carefully, walk in truth. I already mentioned that a while ago. Psalm 86, verse 11, Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Wow. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Hey, another thing we need to do, uh, uh, let us see into that. In Amos chapter 3, verse 3, the Bible says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? We ought to walk together, hadn't we? Boy, it's sad and it's so easy. Uh, the devil will take the least thing, the least difference of opinions, or I don't want to use the word attitude here, but personality would be a better word. But the least of these things, the devil will take those and take a, a molehill and turn it into a stone mountain and bigger in a local church. And isn't it, isn't it sad? But we've got, to, we've got to walk together. Now, I, I know there's other groups of Christians, and I don't want to hang out here long. I, I know there's what we call denominations. I don't believe God meant for it to be that way, but there's folks that teach all kinds of things. No, not, and I'm not of the persuasion that it don't matter what they believe, everything's right because everything's not right. And there's some denominations out there that teach a lot of heresy. But as long as they're teaching salvation by faith and faith alone through the blood of Jesus Christ, we're on the same team. We may not, I don't fellowship with somebody who's got some little errors that I don't, this, uh, I would declare unbiblical and all that. That don't mean I don't love them. That don't mean we're not on the same team. That don't mean I won't stand with them in areas of, of uh, religious liberty. Um, and there's certain areas I stand for. Uh, if we go with, a, go with a march against abortion out in the Capitol, I'll, I'll march right along beside a Catholic or a, uh, whatever, a Mormon or whatever in that area. Maybe I shouldn't have went that. I mean, I, I would, but let me just let me get back to my point there. Rather than trying to split hairs on that, because I'm just trying to say there's truth, and if it ain't truth, it's a lie. 
let me zip, zip back in, and standing for things that are right, I would stand with somebody else. But as far as worshiping, fellowshipping together, and I'm not talking about eating a meal with a coworker, but I'm talking about going having fellowship with a, uh, another person like that, it's pretty limited to strict doctrinal truth. I don't hang around heretics. I'm talking about as far as fellowship. They ain't getting in this pulpit. Uh, they welcome they welcome to visit and come and learn truth. But church, let me get back to the point. I'm just I, I just I just despise the teaching that that all everything. I, I remember uh, these two little ladies in Monticello. They, they never married and they lived together. My, my mom used to always say that that one of those ladies. I ain't gonna say her name in case somebody happened to know them. They've been gone fifty or seventy five years, but but not seventy five because I knew them when I was little. But but I, but but that mom used to always say that. That woman, one of those women said, don't ever talk about a person's religion because that's the best part of them. That's not true. A person's religion might be the part of them that's taking them straight to hell. So we as Christians got to stand in truth. Let's stand in love. And that attitude, I mean, don't have an attitude about that. Don't be ugly about it and all, but we ought to, we ought to walk together. I, I, don't, I don't got my message here. We need to walk together. We need to walk in truth uh, we need to walk humbly. I, I talked about this last week a little bit, and Apostle Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Well, the day we get where we think we're somebody outside of the grace of God, we got a pride problem. And pride don't have to be real big before it's a problem. Pride starts with a little bitty seed in the heart, and it's blinding. I love preaching on pride. Because it's so blinding that people who are suffering with pride and, and, and dealing with the sin of pride in their lives, uh, the pride itself hides pride, and prideful people don't know they're prideful a lot of times, and, and there's false humility that makes them think they're not prideful, and we can be bitten by the bug and poison of pride quickly. Micah 6, 8, He hath showeth me thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly. Psalm, Psalm 119, 105, and I'm going to put it in a verse together, another verse. Psalm 119, 105 and Proverbs 6, 23. We're talking about walking and walking for the Lord, walking in truth, walking together, walking humbly. We've got I start to say a walking stick. You could use it to say that. But we've got a walking light. We've got our, our candle. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How do you go down a path? We, we just said on our feet. In this path of our Christian life we're walking on, we've got to walk according to the precepts of the word of God. And he's got a, it's a light to shine ahead for us. And then Proverbs 6, 23 says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are thy way of life. Isn't that amazing how that fits together, that way of life? That's a path we're walking on day by day. How's your walk, church, Christian, friend? How's your walk today? Then verse 11, it says, And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran, to, ran together unto them into the porch, that is called Solomon's, uh, Solomon's greatly wondering. But, he, but he, he, we see up there earlier that he, his, as his feet gained strength, I'm trying to find the verse, he stood up and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. And man, there's somewhere along the way that it, it turns into a run. We're running. We're running this race. And Hebrews talks about running this race with patience. Hebrews 12, 1, I'll read it in a minute. We need to run and just keep on running until we, I, I think about, you know, as kids, we used to always want to do a prank call. You got to watch out. At a certain point, you couldn't do prank telephone calls because they would uh, call her ID and tell on you. But, you know, ask them if the refrigerator's running. You better stop it. I don't know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all did it. But are you running? Are you running in the race? Are you steady? Just steady running along. Keep on running. Don't stop. You know, and some of us, I'm, uh, I'll be 59 in a few weeks. 
uh, seemed like this last 20 pounds I've gained has slowed my run down tremendously, but I used to still take off and run here and there and, and run about. I, I need to get back to running a little bit. But there's a point in time that we won't run anymore. The age will take care of that, and we just hope to be able to continue walking. And some do, some don't. But when your legs won't run, let your heart keep up the pace. Just because a person ain't physically running, man, I've seen folks in, in nursing home beds doing more for Jesus than a lot of able-bodied folks. We'll let your heart keep up the pace. After all, it's faith, not works, isn't it? It involves it's got to do with the heart more than not the body and the works, isn't it? If we're running on this path and running well, you know, and uh, we used to, the crowd I'm with, preaching, the crowd I'm from, preachers preach more, we get together and preach and I mean, when a preacher's when he's hitting something good or something, sometimes you might hear somebody say, you're running well, preacher. Amen. You're running well. And for the child of God, for the pew, those out in the pew, boy, sometimes, I mean, sometimes these, some of our young men, and uh, I'm, I'm going to just call him out. He may not want to be called out pu public and all that, but old brother Justin, man, he'll be, he'll be up him step six times to service. He'll come down here and, and, uh, and uh, he'll move a speaker, he'll hook up a microphone, he'll run over and do this, run over. He's just, I mean, taking care of business. That's the ministry the Lord uses them in, and praise God for it. And sometimes we'll say, I, I, don't, I, use, I hadn't used those words, I don't reckon, but I will say sometimes, Brother Justin, you're running well, brother. Appreciate you running. Just stay, stay in the race, keep on running. And Christians, as your Sunday school teachers, you that teach children's church, Hey, those of you that clean up around the house of God and that keep the records of the church, keep the finances of the church and all that, hey, keep on running, running well. Appreciate your labors, but more so than that, I appreciate them that your records are put up in heaven. They got eternal weight and eternal value. One day in Matthew 25, 21, it says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee roll over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Those sweet words of the Lord. For those that ran well. Proverbs 32 verse 7. Whatever endeavor you do for the Lord. Run like a Chevy. Don't quit like a Ford. <laughs> you didn't catch that Proverbs 32 verse 7. I said that just a little humor to get your attention there, but Lord would have us to continue. First of all, are you standing? Do you know Christ your Savior? How about if you come forward with invitation on this morning? Brother Charles, if you come up, maybe you know, we'll have verse 2 this morning of a song. Do you know Christ your Savior? Is, you ever, is your position, do you know Christ? Have you been saved? Do you, is your position standing by grace in Christ? Christian, are you walking? Walking truthfully, walking faithfully? Are you running well? Are you continuing in the race? I said I'd read Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing you also compassed about so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We've got a crazy race. If there ever was such a true statement as a rat race, we in it, ain't we? We need to keep on running with our eyes on Jesus. What do you need to do this morning? Are you saved? Do you know Christ your Savior? Uh, what song, brothers? Is that? Amen. What do you need to do today? Are you saved? Are you walking faithfully? Are you staying in the race? What do you need to do today? To Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender Yeah. 
I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Amen. Appreciate your attention this morning. Good to be in God's house this morning on a good, cold, chilly day. I'll be honest with you. When I first come in here this morning, we, we got started. and uh, We forgot something. had to turn and go back and get something. So we just kind of pushed for time a little bit. But the first thing I did, I hit the light switch. So I ran to the water fountain to make sure we still had water this morning. I was, I was <laughs> so glad to just have water. Praise God for water today. Amen. 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 But uh, anyway, it's good to see everybody here today. Good to be in God's house. Um, <laughs> tell somebody about Jesus. Invite somebody to Hearts Baptist Church. And uh, just keep on running, running well. More is great reward at the end of the race, I promise you. More than my promise, according to the Word of God. Brother Wayne, how about dismissing the Word of Prayer, if you would, please?